Our first story deals with a subculture of heavy metal music that some feel is sending a dangerous message to your kids. The forces of evil on the dark side of devil rock. And I want to talk tonight about the devil and demons and witches and wizards. And we just mix it up with hardcore and aggression and come out with something that we think is an original sound. Loud, fast, heavy, you know. Well, what do you got? What do you got? If you're listening to Riff Worship, the podcast that maybe attempts to answer the question, what riff, how riff, when riff, why riff, talking about our favorite riffs, our favorite albums containing riffs, talking to people sometimes about their favorite riffs. I'm one of your hosts, Austin Paulson. With me, as always, are my co-hosts in music in Riff, Justin Swindle, Dylan Adams. Uh, hi, guys. How are you doing? I'm doing great. What's your favorite riff? Uh, Dylan, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something, Mean Gene. I've been sitting here pounding and grinding and going and going and going, just getting ready for this episode. I'm doing pretty good. I'm going to let him tire himself out. Dylan's hopped up on the sh- <laughs> um, Dylan, what's know your what favorite, favorite riff? How long does it take to get to Louisville? <laughs> <laughs> like two and a half hours from where you are. Okay, I'll see you in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a loaded question. I, I, that's why we started this podcast because I can't. That's a hard one. It's not. You can't lay your finger on one. You can't touch just one. Different riffs for different folks. Sometimes I'm feeling one way. Other times I'd like uh, another riff. I don't know. It's a hard question. What's your favorite riff, you jackass? Uh, Watch them be able to tell us. Yeah, right? The I don't even remember the song now, but the one that always gets stuck in my head is the fucking uh, Eddie Van Halen riff from the Michael Jackson song. Uh, you're talking about uh, uh, Eat It, right? Panhead! <laughs> That's, that riff is probably the catchiest riff ever written in my well, head i guess we're done with the show then yeah, huh? that's, that's it. over <laughs> it's over Wrap it it's up. done <laughs> thanks for tuning in we'll see you that's it that's Bye. it we're never doing this again wow we answered who would have thought we would have just had to ask swindle my life is a waste <laughs> i wasted a year of my life editing and just slaving away and then you you knew the the best riff of all time is just eddie van halen and beat it which is wild because I also don't really love Van Halen. Those are my first two concerts, but you know, I guess I should just go f myself. I suppose. <laughs> um, we're uh, back again to continue in our trilogy of Sludge of New Orleans of Sammy Duay of some pretty monumental bands of the scene and the region. Uh, the last time we started this discussion on uh new orleans we kind of began with goat whore uh a haunting curse their third album from 2006 this week we're going to go back even further into sammy's catalog his discography his prolific, his prolific history in aggressive music uh this album is there's a lot of backstory on this album and this band there's a lot of lore and just drama and all these different things but one thing this album definitely has is a whole lot of riffs and so uh it's definitely a whole an album lot we, for sure yeah, many many uh you know this album has a lot of songs i don't know maybe this is like a question i'll ask at some point maybe maybe too many i don't know it's mm -hmm. a long record for sure um but one thing for sure that i will certainly agree with is that it has plenty of just hard-hitting just riffs uh, there's a lot of different influences on this record from Sabbath to, uh, you know, hardcore to death metal to, you know, Dylan's mentioned a few times off air in preparation for this. Sounds kind of like a grunge record in a yep. lot of ways. And I, I could, I could certainly see that, but we are of course talking about, uh, acid bath. We're not necessarily a new Orleans band. I would say. They were kind of more they were southern, as far south as you could get before you hit the fucking water. Yeah, uh, this is a uh, an, an outlier band in a lot of ways. Yep. Outliers in the scene, outliers in sound. You can certainly hear it on their deb debut record, "When the Kite String Pops," from nineteen ninety four. The record we're going to be talking about today. 
Uh, why this record? And just to kind of start us out, why, why this record? Why this band? You know, when we started talking about kind of doing this trilogy, right? Um, you know, we could have easily have done the, a Crowbar record. We could have easily have done an I Hate God record. But I, I, I touched on this in our Goat Whore uh, episode with uh, Sammy, you know, uh, Sammy Duay of Goat Whore, Acid Bath, uh, many other projects. Um, you know, I didn't feel like he, I still don't feel like he gets the just desserts that he should get uh, when it comes to appreciation of the type of writer he is, the type of player he is, and his influence on the New Orleans sound. Um, you know, maybe he's receiving that now because he's an elder statesman, uh, but he's just the fucking dude. Like when it comes to riffs, uh, he's just the dude. Seems like a very personable person. Uh, he, you know, just is very informal of a lot of information regarding acid bath. Uh, is a big supporter of people knowing that stuff. Uh, dude also likes riffs, guitars, and his kitties. I mean, like you can't get you can't get past that shit. A man after your own heart, for sure. I I made it a point to pick kind of quintessential albums from his catalog. Uh, the first Metal Blade release with Goat Whore's A Haunting Curse. Uh, his first full length he was ever on when a kite string pops. Uh, and I'll leave the other one up in the air. Uh, for when we do that episode, and we'll touch on that one. Uh, but just quintessential albums from his catalog. Um, and it seems like these, you know, the first two we've picked are going to be big ones. I mean, uh, it's arguable that there's probably not as recognizable as an album of an album uh, for his career as this one, I would say. Um, be it from the artwork, from the kind of mystique around the band. Uh, only putting out two records and then they're they're gone. Um, you know, not really seeing the heights that some of the other sludge bands maybe did with like opening for Pantera, uh, doing all of that. Um, it just and it's a weird album, a weird album in a positive way. I, I feel like sometimes when people say something's weird, they mean it in a negative connotation. Um, this is a very strange album. It is all the influences you instinctively hear all the influences and they do sound like those influences, but it makes sense when it's tied all together. It doesn't just sound like part, 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 Yeah. but you can instinctively hear from song to song like, Oh, that's a death metal track. That's hardcore. That's, you know, a little bit more kind of like hard rock grunge. There's even some like doom metal stuff in here too. Definitely. Um, and like, you can hear all that. And, I've kind of got a hot take on this one uh, and we'll touch on this is I think this was a big influence on a lot of new metal bands and I don't see them admitting that uh, when listening to this album, I fucking hear it from the the vocals, the way the riffs are played, the low tunings, um, the bass is very upfront in the mix in this. It, it has a pretty beefy distorted sound um, and this album came out the same year as Korn's debut album. So obviously two bands that sound vastly different. One's influenced by probably more traditional metal structures and the other one's influenced by like Mr. Bungle and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, whereas with this, it's, you can still hear it in the guitar tones. You can still hear it in kind of the songs. It's, it's there. If you listen to that first Korn record and this album side to side, there's a lot more similarities than we realize. Um, I don't know if Sammy would be happy with that, but <laughs> it's there. Uh, Swindle, have you heard this record before? What is your relationship with this band? Uh, again, as a maybe kind of coming off of the same theme as our first episode and on this territory. Um, I don't know if you really had too many, uh, too much of a relationship with this band or record. Nope, no, I never uh, listened to this band or album before this. Yeah, what are your initial thoughts? Like, what was your listening experience like when diving into this debut record? I <laughs> the the uh, matter the subject matter is fucking dark, which I'm sure we'll cover. Uh, there's a lot of space on the album. Like, uh, I 
think I would stick with the like a crowbar more because I feel like the song structures are more like compact and not necessarily like not that crowbar is pop music, but like the song structures are pop song structures. This band. I will say I agree with with Swindle statement in that, you know, you listen to this record. I don't think they were afraid or. They shied away from trying an idea like they somebody from clearly. The yeah, someone clearly was like, hey, maybe this spoken word part would go really great here. Or yeah. maybe, uh, yeah, like a doom part would make the most sense here. Some acoustic passages or what have you. This this band really wasn't afraid to try a thing for a, a particular song. Um, it doesn't. It is a, like you said, a weird record. It's not like it, it feels like kind of haphazardly cobbled together. It makes sense for the band for sure. Like if it, because it's always been like this. So how could it not make sense for this band <laughs> in particular? But uh, yeah, lots of influences on this record. I certainly you hear Sabbath. Uh, I think you could hear Celtic Frost, like as we heard with the last record that we covered uh, Carcass at times. Uh, I hear I incantation read, all yeah, over the album. Sure. Uh, I read even someone mentioned Simon and Garfunkel for, you know, some songs as well. Wild. You know, whatever. Um, um, can I can I touch on something real quick? Oh, of course. Um, you know, I, I had that whole diatribe earlier about how it sounds, but I didn't really touch on the first time I heard this band. Oh yeah. Um, so I got to shout out a uh, an Arkansas friend of mine named uh, Joey Llewellyn. Um, I was getting ready to move up here, and like I remember my close friend Norm and I uh, spent like a week just like hanging out nonstop, and we went and hung out at a friend of his named Joey. And Joey had like all of these records and all of this stuff on like his old school computer. And he's like, hey, man, you're getting ready to move. Why don't you just upload a lot of this stuff on like a disc and just take it with you? And like that way you can listen to it. And he had this record and he had their second album. So I was like, never heard this. Got to get it. So at like 19 years old the, was the first time I ever heard this. And, you know, it was this guy named Joey Llewellyn, who is a great dude and has a lot of tie ins with like the Arkansas music scene, has played with uh, a couple of the guys from Wake and other bands and stuff like that. So hopefully he listens to this episode and enjoys this and knows that this helped influence picking this episode. You caused this. This is why we're talking about this right now. This is your fault. This Joey, is your fault. This is you. Uh, no, I'm I'm excited to to get into kind of uh, the record and the backstory of this band because yeah, it's like kind of uh, it's a long history. I mean, this band essentially yeah. started out as two separate bands. Mm -hmm. There is a band called Golgotha as well as Dark Carnival, uh, which Dark Whoop Carnival. Uh, <laughs> we got some Fago here. Where we got uh, so Dark Carnival essentially has two members, uh, Sammy as well as Audi. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it. How do you pronounce his last name? It's Audi. I think it's Petrie. And then Golgotha has three members. You have Dax Riggs, Mike Sanchez, and Jimmy Kyle. And so those bands basically kind of formed together. Now they kept the Golgotha name for a while and they recorded, I think that band had recorded like two demos I found. There's uh, Wet Dreams of the Insane from 91. Uh, it was like a single sided tape. It had like nine songs. It was nearly 40 minutes. How is it one side? <laughs> when you said the title to the demo, um, I saw Swindle just sigh. <laughs> it was so funny. I was looking at my notes and I was like, wait, why are they laughing? Uh, yeah. Wet I dreams know, of the insane. I want to know why that was a one sided cassette and it was 40 minutes. Why did yeah, it said why? single sided tape? In 40, 40 minutes. I don't know. How. They why didn't did flip they the tape, Swindle. That's all it is. They just didn't why, flip the tape. It's okay. Why choose a 90 minute cassette and only use one side of it? Why? Because they're cheaper. Why? No. <laughs> they were cheaper back then. They were, you could buy those cheap cassettes from the fucking like get in, get out store. And like they were 90 minutes and they're just like, well, we don't want to flip it. Let's just record to our like dat player into this tape. You only have so much money, man. You got it. You got to have room for your big gulp and you got to have money for, you know, <laughs> small order. towns, man. Small towns. They were sharing four dollars. <laughs> the whole town. 
Everybody the in the town was sharing that four dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so you have this demo. You also uh, went well the Golgotha, like maybe the original iteration of this band. I uh, also re- uh, recorded, which I listened to this K- uh, KLSU radio, which mm-hmm. is basically the college radio station for LSU in Baton Rouge. Um, another single sided tape, 11 minutes. It's the other side of the original tape. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, but yes, so then this band comes together through these two groups, our carnival Golgotha, they keep the Golgotha name, but mm-hmm. then they realize another band in Europe has the same name. So they change their name to acid bath and to kind of begin a long and dark history of using oh. really fucked up imagery. <laughs> this band name originates from what I understand uh, from the British serial killer, John Hay. Is it John? I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't care. Fuck this guy because uh, <laughs> he was known as the acid bath murderer. And basically I'm sure you could put it together. He murdered people and put them in a bath of sulfuric acid. So there you go. That's where we kind of begin as well. There's a lot of information out about this band for a band that really doesn't have a ton of information on it. Um, you know, it seemed like some of the goat horror information was easier to come by even, even though this has a dedicated YouTube channel called the acid bath archives. Yes. Um, Check it out. That was yes. super helpful in absolutely learning anything about this band. And, uh, you know, like you kind of mentioned Sammy as like an elder statesman, you know, kind of, uh, making it sure that people know about the history of some of the stuff that, uh, some of the things that he's worked on over the years, yeah. which again, this is very helpful, uh, for a band that, you know, really didn't exist in the, in the grand scheme of things for like a very long period of time. So, but the very, whole very cool. serial killer thing is, is interesting because depending upon the information that you find, it's conflicting. You know, some of the guys have been like, there was no, we did not have a serial killer thing going on. We weren't into them. It wasn't our thing. And then some of them are like, we just kind of wanted to do something that would draw attention. You know, we wanted to do anything. And even the label was like freedom of speech. Um, you know, we do what we want because they're named at, obviously they're possibly named after a serial killer. Uh, I've heard in some interviews that there was just some band called acid bath that before them that they were like, that band doesn't exist anymore. Would you mind if we use it kind of thing? Uh, and the, the, I mean, that even leads into the choice of the artwork, which we'll get into as well. Um, it's, it's wild for a band that came from a really small area of Louisiana, um, to already have this weird mystique about them without even having like a major demo out or have any sort of record deal or really have been playing that many shows. Rock stars are a lot like wrestlers. They don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. That's a that's a Bruce Pritchard story. <laughs> don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. This band, after they had changed their name to Acid Bath, uh, they released a demo uh, that didn't really have an official title, but it has become known as the Hymns of the Needle Freak demo, which very hard to find. Um, this earned them their deal with Rotten Records, who we kind of touched on in the last episode. Uh, now, this wasn't the first label that was actually interested in Acid Bath. Uh, Century Media was mm-hmm. actually the first label, I think, to show some interest towards signing the band. At the time, I Hate God was also signed to Century Media, which I think they still are, correct? They signed could... again recently. Within yes. Within the last okay. few years. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, at the time, I Hate God was not satisfied with their relationship yep. with the label. And so once Century Media showed an interest in signing Acid Bath, hey, let's talk to our friends really quick and see what how they feel about it. They did not happy. Okay, well, then we'll just move on to the next one. Uh, the other label that was interested as well, huge label, uh, Road Racer or better than Road Runner Records. Fucking also wild intru- when I heard that. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, some of the bands that would have been signed at the time. Uh, typo I'm negative. To think, typo negative would have been a huge one. Uh, Machine Head, Sepultura, Obituary, like you name it. Yeah. So for a band that really only had a demo out, essentially, to get that sort of like eyes on them is really crazy. I blame Monty Connor. 
Monty Connor, who we also talked about in our Andy LaRock episode, mm-hmm. he kind of made the connection with death and Andy LaRock playing on uh, individual thought patterns. Uh, Monty Connor, the A&R guy for a Roadrunner, Road Ra- uh, you know, Road Racer at the time, he made a trip down to Louisiana because he was also interested in uh, signing X Order, I believe, at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, he went to an acid bath show and he fell asleep at the show. And so I don't know if the guy was just like, well, I fell asleep, so I guess I'm not going to pick you up or whatever. You know, I I think Sammy had uh, said in one of the uh, videos that I saw on the Acid Bath archive that he would later kind of say that he uh, regretted not signing them at the time, you know, so regardless, they go with Rotten Records, which was really the only other label that was interested in signing the band. and I. you know, based on what we've heard, what we know about this label, they did not have a great relationship moving forward. Um, kind of one of those classic cases of young band, very hungry, very ready to be signed, didn't look at the contract too closely. And, you know, that that's essentially what happened. I mean, even finding vinyl copies of the two acid bath records is daunting. Uh, yeah, there have been represses, but finding them is almost impossible. Like you almost have to either just happen upon them or you just have to know somebody that's got a copy. Uh, like I took a, I even looked at like rotten records website and it says they have them in stock, but it's, you know, I don't know the reliability of that website as well. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to come by this stuff. Even the streaming platforms just got this stuff within the last couple of years. Exactly. When I heard of this band, when I came into like listening to acid bath, it was not through, Spotify or Apple Music, you could not check this record out essentially for a really long time. And much of what you could listen to was probably on YouTube of like people, you know, bootlegging their own yep. sort of like streaming version of it, which the label would be very quick to take down. So Real quick. it was very difficult to check this record out. Y'all know what band is on Rotten Records? What's Dog that? Fashion Disco. Is it really? Is it really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. damn the lore continues wow. with this band whoa i still don't know what they sound like at all so we definitely have to like we 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 got to do a reaction video of hearing that for the first time uh, or that, something. yeah apparently <laughs> wow I, I don't know anything I, about them that nothing um yeah it definitely seems like rotten records biggest claim to fame unless swindles looking at their like lineup they had at one point it's probably acid bath. Like that's that. Yeah, that's where they salt the wound. Salt the wound was on rotten. Wow. Dri dri also. That makes sense. Yeah, we'll be talking about that in a second. I mean, even with the, I don't necessarily think the first two goat whore records are even pressed. I think. I mean, you can stream them, you can find them, but I don't think you can actually own a physical copy. So, uh, I know there have been issues with even getting merch to people from acid bath, like, um, because of the legalities. And I think Sammy's even touched on, he's attempted to buy the rights of the acid bath stuff, but they've got a, such a massive price on it for whatever reason. They know what they have. I mean, really like, yeah, but then, but why keep it? Why hoard it? I mean, it's just right. So if you're not going to do anything with it and you're not going to allow people to maybe have a physical copy of very Tony Brummel of them, (laughs) There are bad people in the music industry. I don't <laughs> fucking believe it. So, yes, they sign with Rotten Records, and then you have their debut record, When the Kite String Pops, which was released on August 8th of 94. Um, this was produced by Spike Cassidy. We kind of mentioned DRI. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the guitarist of DRI. I know they've had some shows together. Uh, there is a Greg Troyner, who is also mentioned, and then Acid Bath, who are also credited with uh, production of this record. Uh, it was digitally recorded and mixed in Louisiana and then it mastered in uh, California, apparently. Uh, but let's go through uh, maybe the lineup, shall we? Um, you have Dax Riggs as the lead vocalist. You have Sammy Duay on guitar and backing vocals. Mike Sanchez on guitar and backing vocals. Uh, Audie Petrie on bass and backing vocals. And Jimmy Kyle on drums. Mm-hmm. So how'd he get left out? Everybody's got backing vocal credits on here except the drummer. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. Just didn't like it, I guess. Y'all know drummers can't sing. 
excuse me, sir. Phil Collins is a uh, godsend of a singer, sir. Uh, who do you who do you ever beat? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, uh, Don Henley. <laughs> oh yeah, Don Henley. Yeah. Don Henley. Um, um, I mean, there you go. That's it. That's Two all guys. I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd he beat? <laughs> what was finished? I almost thought he said. I almost thought he said Hootie. Like, <laughs> oh no, I, I know like, what he who? said. The Hootie beat. Hootie, hootie beat. The, the Hootie oh, beat. That's like a, that's like a weird D beat. <laughs> yeah. That beat defined a whole genre. The Hootie beat. The, the Hootie beat. The Hootie and the Bluefish beat. God, I hope he gets fucking like. I hope he gets copyright credits for that shit. <laughs> he will. His name is Hootie. For everybody <laughs> listening, Darius Rucker is a stage name. His name is Hootie. <laughs> Patrice was right. <laughs> He's going to have lawyers on your ass. <laughs> hey, Hootie. <laughs> Even the lawyer calls him Hootie. Hey, Hootie, this very uh, niche uh, heavy metal podcast. <laughs> it's cracking jokes. They're getting their jollies off, making fun of you. Hit him with everything we got. They're slandering your name, Hootie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are we talking about again? Oh, we There's a, some sort of record. We're, we're talking about a record. We're talking about I Only Want to Be With You by Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> uh, so something about dolphins crying. like. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> as Dylan mentioned earlier, this band, their kind of visual... Uh, the visual content or like their whole aesthetic is very man very fucked up to really just put it simply. <laughs> um, and so both records, both records, you have like a band, this essentially spawned from a band who could not agree on an album cover from what I understand. So the, I guess the owner, perhaps I don't know if this is the owner, Ron Peterson of rotten records knew a guy who was a huge, like, serial killer collector, fanatic, whatever you want to call him. It's fucking Merle Allen or some shit. It's wild. The guy was apparently in contact with serial killers. He owned a lot of artwork from serial killers. And so uh, he must have had this painting, Pogo the Clown number 15, uh, which was painted by John Wayne Gacy of Chicago, a serial killer. He was also known as the Skull Clown. Um, and so he was like a clown for hire who murdered a bunch of children. Piece of shit, huge garbage person. The guy that ha- yeah, don't also trust that- the- don't trust that guy. If that guy yeah. is still the fuck alive, don't trust him. Yeah, that's why like I've never understood it. I I've listened to like true crime before. Mm-hmm. I don't really see the appeal and I just feel gross. I but you know, I listen to fucked up shit. I'll get into this in a minute, but so they, they they couldn't um you know they couldn't uh agree on an album cover and uh, basically Ron was like well what well, how about this painting God. and so they went with the John Wayne Gacy painting as their album cover now there are like mixed accounts about how people feel about yeah. this you know thing like this this album cover in particular like I, from what I understand, Dax Riggs, the vocalist, he says that the label forced them to use it, and he didn't care for it. But if you listen to his lyrics, I, you know, like if it was a question of morality or whatever, or maybe he wanted to use something else, I don't know where the argument is there because you're also writing about some pretty, some pretty heinous shit. You know, it's 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 interesting because the '90s was kind of lawless. Uh, this was still like the Wild West when it came to what is considered decent versus what's not um you know it's not my i wouldn't own a piece of serial killer art i wouldn't own anything that glorifies a serial killer you know uh i'm not gonna wear a shirt with fucking Dahmer on it or anything like that um but is it is it interesting subject matter to write about when it comes to music entertainment anything like that yeah because it piques interest it's like that's really fucked up. Uh, now I need to hear what they're talking about in the song. Like I have to hear that, you know, uh, was it a good marketing tactic for this album? If the label pushed it, I mean, we're talking about it 30 years yeah. later. 
It's um, a very uh, it's a very eye catching piece of art, especially if you already know what it is. It's probably a very Willy Wonka moment. The the is label guys like le- <laughs> the label guys like let's use the John Wayne Gacy uh, artwork and the guy. Who wrote all the lyrics is like, no, please don't. Oh, he does it like a <laughs> fucking don't, baby. Dude. <laughs> like, I would 100% bet that there is some validity to that. Um, the 90s, we kind of touched on this off air too, where like the 90s was, the 90s had this weird vibe when it came to vocalists and bands. Like everyone was this weird, dark, violent, aggressive poet. And like everything had to make sense in that sense. And it's just them spouting like random shit into a mic. Um, very like I mentioned the corn record. Uh, they have a song on there that addresses, you know, a pretty taboo subject uh, as well. And like very in the same vibe of the lyrical prowess uh, of this record. This might even be a little bit more daunting. Um when it comes to it, but we'll, we'll touch on the lyrical process of that later. But the, you know, as far as the album artwork yeah. is concerned, I, I mentioned, I like listening to dark, yeah, heavy, absolutely. fucked up shit, right? We, we all do. We all like cannibal corpse. Yep. I like cattle decapitation. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe it's, it's different in a lot, in a lot of ways. You look at a, a cannibal corpse album cover, right? There's so many that are like known for being very graphic and very yeah, violent or, absolutely. you know, very controversial in their own way. But at the at, at, there's a, some level of it in the back of your head, you know, that it is like a fantastical thing. It's like made up in yeah. a lot of ways, whereas this is a real physical yes. thing that happened. Like we the know about this person. In jail. Yeah. Like, so this is, you know, reality versus reality versus uh you know, fake comic book shit. I don't yeah. know. I, you know, I'm not, is it for me to say, like you said, I, it wouldn't be me. Yeah. Like <laughs> I wouldn't be the guy to put this on my record, but this is what happened. And, you know, I guess there is an argument to be made. We're, we're yeah. still essentially talking about it, I guess. Um, so. We're obviously not talking about this record, but their second record had artwork from fucking Jack Kevorkian. Yeah. On the cover. Oh n- no. <laughs> They're they were supposed to use like uh that wasn't even the original. It was supposed artwork. to be like a negative of all the band. I heard it was like a like a pig head or something like a that's decapitated it. Yes, it was a, it was a slaughtered head. animal. Yes. Yeah. So like you know where which one do we use? Here? <laughs> and <laughs> like, they've got like a B size and rarities comp or something that's got artwork from um Richard Ramirez. Oh, the, thank uh, you, Night Stalker. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like man. I think that guy just had all of this shit. Like the, that single guy. That makes more just, sense. Don't for trust For whatever him. reason, don't trust If that him. guy's still alive, don't trust that guy. <laughs> um, so yes, you have the album cover. Maybe we should get more into the actual contents of the record. So you have 14 songs. This album is an hour long. It's, it this essentially thing is 70 t- minutes long. <laughs> it's crazy. It You essentially have... Uh, basically the two demos that they released under the acid bath namesake. Yes. All of those songs from either split ended up re like recorded for this record. They used all that of the app material. They re-recorded it and they put it together. So you have 14 tracks total. Um, I mean the first song alone, uh, per- perhaps one of their more, I would say this is probably a signature song. I yes. think this song was originally called you on the demo but it became the blue. Uh, this thing is full of riffs. Yep. Sabbath, uh, Sabathi, is that what you call it? Sabathian. In the Sabathian. Sabathian riffs. Um, it's a, it's a great song. I fucking love this song for sure. It's, it's a great opener. Uh, if I remember right, doesn't it open with like some feedback in that chorus bass? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, which you'll is, hear that all over this. It's record, all over sure. the record. If it's not a chorus bass, it's a heavily distorted bass that is still audible. Um, and yeah, unlike the, uh, unlike the goat horror record, you can really, you can really <laughs> hear every instrument separately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that also attests to maybe the recording style. It's a very sparse recording as well. Yeah. There's not a ton of guitar layers. Like there's, there's different layers from different things throughout, but the, the guitars are probably layered one or two tracks. 
Um, it's a very, it's a very, you can tell this is the first time the band's been in a bigger studio, uh, for sure, upon listening to it. And touching on what you said earlier about this is literally their whole set of songs. They were like, this is what we have. We're fucking recording it. And let's put it out. And a lot of bands did that in the 90s. Albums would be really long uh, just because that's what the material they did. They had. I mean, this band had been playing together for a few years by this point, And they were like, let's just record all of our good songs. And they put it on there. Um, but the blue is a great opener. Great. Yeah. Great, great, opener. great opener, probably track. one of one of the songs on the album that I will go back and listen to. I would say you also kind of get a feel for Dax's uh, vocal range on this album. Um, so, like I said, he's not afraid to nope. try a particular vocal delivery because you will have moments where he is just like full on screaming and it's great. Like he does a good job at that. And then you kind of have these moments where he's singing like he has this like very particular unique clean vocal style to he's the own. lizard king and that's not a joke like it, it did when i hear him i go like this is like a jim morrison thing even some of the lyrical prose that are on here makes me think of like you know not necessarily one track by the doors will allude to that but it's it's all over this and and that's not necessarily a negative thing um but it's it he definitely if he wasn't listening to the doors, he just happens to sound this way. Just kind of a baritone croon. Um, the next song, also very Sabathian. You mm-hmm. have like uh, Tranquilize, which almost has this like Sabbath wah type effect going on, like almost just ripped right yeah. from, you know, Master of Reality or Volume 4 or whatever. Um, I also get grunge elements from this as well. It sounds like something. Soundgarden would do or Alice in Chains. Very Cantrell esque. Absolutely. In, in feel. There is a uh, really, gr- the one thing that stuck out to me about the song was there's a vocal break, kind of like I live tranquilized. When he hits that line, it just everything cuts out except this mm-hmm. vocal part. Loved it. Uh, doom ass breakdown in this song as well uh, with like some killer bass tone. I don't know if you guys have any notes on this song in particular, but uh, those were some of the things that stuck out to me about it for sure. I think we've all talked about like longer albums um, when it comes to this. This was, I've listened to this album probably five times throughout kind of knowing the album. Um, And sometimes when albums are really long, it's hard for me to pick out like songs a lot on it. And I can remember parts, but for whatever reason, I in re-listening to this, I still had some difficulty kind of picking out certain parts that would really, so the parts that did stick with me were like, okay, this is fucking great. But then there would be, there's so much material that it's hard to grasp over just like certain things. Um, And that's not to say that there are some long albums I do like, uh, but sometimes it can, it's a negative. Sometimes it can be a little too much material um, to take in all at once. This would have been, this could literally be two records. I think so. I think that's the the biggest thing is that, I don't necessarily feel like there's a bad song on the record or like, but you could certainly make the argument that, Hey, maybe you could have like split this up a little yeah, bit. Does, does this really need to be as long as it was one song in particular that I think swindle would have, maybe you did, maybe you hated it. I don't know. But one song that I think you would have really liked uh, cheap vodka. I think that's like the most traditional sludge, hardcore feeling track to this album. And it's literally just about being drunk, irritable, and violent. <laughs> I I liked this track a lot. Um, made me think of Stumbling Man by Tad, which is, again, about just being drunk and rambling around. Um, I love this. I like this track. It's simplistic. It's straightforward. It's it's the closest. It's the first track on the album that actually makes me think of a sludge track. Yeah. It's very I Hate God-esque yes. type, of, type of song. The note uh, that I took for the for this song was that the end of the song was like the first time on the album that I was like, Oh, uh, this is this influence new metal, like the very end of this song. Yes. Uh, I love the, the vocal, uh, the vocal lines and we're meat that, and that's it. Fuck it. Like <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, we didn't touch on it in the goat whore episode and we probably should have, uh, a lot of sludge 
especially the bands from New Orleans, are influenced by uh, Carnivore. And some of the lyrics on here really make me think of the, that first Carnivore record a lot. That's fair. Uh, matter of fact, when we saw Goat Horror all those years ago, they used, uh, oh God, what did they use? They, they kind of did a sampling of Jesus Hitler. Oh, did they really? The, oh, was it the opening? Yep. I forget. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's fair. But yeah, there's a lot of lyrics on here that are, make me think of those kind of tongue in cheek lyrics from that first Carnivore record. Our next song, maybe the, the Morrison uh, track yes. that we've been kind of alluding to, uh, Finger Paintings of the Insane. Uh, Swindle, how'd you feel about this song? <laughs> uh, well, before the very end of the song, uh, which is the Morrison shit, there is like, also, white guy rapping. Uh, yeah, that was leading into yeah. new metal uh, influence. <laughs> that shit uh, was. Um, yeah, my he like ball cap. He he blows <laughs> through it. Um, I think uh, most of the song I like. There's uh, even the part with like the more, like musically, I like it. Lyrically, I'm not sure about. Is, but is this the song that has the Oedipus? Oed- Oedipus kind of thing in it about Oedipus. 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 Uh, Epididymitis. Has, <laughs> Epididymitis. Let me redo that. Yeah. Is this the song that has the Oedipus kind of chant in it? It, it okay. does. Yeah. As, as soon as I heard that in prepping for this, I listened to it and went, Swindle is going to hate this. Yeah, absolutely. The whole song. <laughs> the lyrics are absolutely fucking depraved. Yeah, it's not great. It the, this song makes me think of a found horror film, like a found uh, footage horror film, a lot. Like some of the really brutal stuff, like August Underground or anything like that. Like this is the type of music that would play in that that type of movie. It's funny uh, in the notes, somebody put that uh, the lyrics were uh, influenced by Clive Barker because I was literally going to make a joke that the this album sounds like what that uh that uh pile of muscles <laughs> in hellraiser listened to uh before <laughs> he started before killing, killing frank hey you know what that's a compliment even like that that's a compliment that I, I get it you know this is the lyrics on this album are not for the faint at heart at all um this the the kind of like syncopated vocal line in this and the rapping vocal line is definitely akin to what you said at the top of the episode, which was they're not afraid to take chances. They were doing anything and everything they could to really say, let's see what we got. Let's see how this works. Certainly an outlier band. And yes. Yeah. The, even in the sludge genre, they are an outlier band for sure. Definitely a Jim Morrison part at the, so the, like after the rapping, there's just like, I didn't like it. I don't think, I think that yeah. line's, fucking stupid but it definitely does remind me of just jim morrison just rambling kind of yeah you know poetry on stage uh he did a lot of spoken word shit i think they released an album of his like spoken word tracks after he had passed where yes, like, they the sure band did had, american like, poet yeah and they yep. so they recorded like music underneath it and then released like his spoken word um, poetry. i stuff. don't i don't want us to I don't want anybody out there to think we're shitting on this album because we're not shitting on this record. We're just giving kind of the, we're giving the first reaction of when we heard this album of, you know, what the lyrics brought to mind, because it's very obvious that this is a very influential album on many, many artists. Um, And it's very evident that this was a, Lyrically, this was also kind of a commonplace thing in the early 90s. Sure. Um, with this, it was very, very just like whatever's on my brain's coming out, you know, whatever's coming in. This, I think Dax has even said that Acid Bath was his high school band, and he meant that in a negative connotation. I heard that and I went, it makes complete sense. Cause when you're in your first high school band, or at least like, like I was, you did anything. You played anything. You tried anything to see what it would sound like if that's your feel. That's where you kind of learn your roots, right? That's where you kind of learn the type of musician, the type of player you want to be. And all of these guys are young guys by this point, and they're learning how to be the artist that they went on to become. And, you know, 
if you listen to the album that followed this, there's none of this type of lyric lyricism on that record. Uh, it's also a shorter record as well. Yeah. It's a little bit more uh, Sabbath, maybe blues rock kind of vibe, hard rock on that album. It's very much a straightforward record compared to this one. Uh, but I just wanted to get that out there because, yeah, we're having fun with this, but yeah, we're yeah. not shitting on the album by any means. Right. It's just, it's like. It's there. Yeah. I like the music of the song. I do like. I think there's there's certainly some good riffs in there. Um, is this the track even, that has like the weird doom harmony in the middle? I think so. And it also has like some like almost like dungeony type synth. This has. Yeah, this is it. that track. So yeah. again, just really doing whatever. Yeah. Like because I don't think that if I remember right, I don't think that even makes a return on the record. The rest mm -mm. of the album. So it's like uh, there are a lot of go. things like that on this record. They'll They'll do something one time and then it never visits again. Like they never touch on it again. It's just there. And that's 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 what I really like about this record is the spontaneity of like, oh, we've already done it. We're not going to do it again. I, I do enjoy that a lot. Um, and what we should also note is that I believe everybody in this band is writing shit. Every single member is writing. And it's very clear on these albums because it does sound like different writers at different points. Um, I feel like I can tell, you know, Sammy's writing from like Mike Sanchez is writing or or Audie's writing on here. And, you know, if you got down to it, you probably could tell exactly who wrote what in this band. To go off of the theme of maybe this album inf influencing new metal later on, I think the next uh, uh, song especially has some uh, of that influence. I Jezebel. like this song a lot. This song's great. Yep. It also kind of reminded me of some Slipknot influence yep. as well. I think there was like, oh, hey, shit. And then you turn around and watch an interview where apparently uh, maybe an early tour for Acid Bath, Slipknot opened for them. They didn't sound anything really like mm -hmm. they did now. And so maybe there's the thing of like, oh, well, maybe did they hear this band and they changed their sound up? But I think it's pretty safe to say that you could maybe compare a song like this to maybe some more modern contemporary Slipknot tracks. I Say, could okay, hear. I could kind of see that. Yeah, I could hear definite influence on like a Corey Taylor, uh, especially on that first Slipknot record with like "Wait and Bleed." There, okay, "Wait and Bleed," and in particular, um, very much the sing scream thing that Dax is doing. Uh, there's a song on the first record called "Purity" that's about a um, a young woman being buried alive by a killer. Bah, there you go. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's direct influence. And if it's not, it's just coincidence. But in music, it's never a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> the like first bit of the song, they were doing fast fucking triplets. And they were like, uh, I think it was like the tightest, like. Tightest they played on like the whole album, like all together, they were tight. I, I really enjoy this song. I also like the next two songs, too. Um, Screams of the Butterfly is a fun song. Uh, Dr. Seuss is Dead has a really kind of, if it's got like a blue scale riff in it, that is, you know, it, it works really well uh, with the type of band this is. Um, I, I really like out of the album, like these are the three tracks in a row that are sequenced well for me um, because I went, oh, okay, if it sounded maybe just like these three tracks, I would be all in for this album. Maybe it like a, like we've been kind of saying, maybe it's not necessarily perfect. Maybe it could have been organized differently or right. perhaps you could have used this as two different releases. But but that's what uh, makes yeah. it an anomaly. That's right. And so it adds to the kind of lore and, and mystery of this band and just how, you know, again, how much different this is than some of their contemporaries in that were based in New Orleans, like your crowbars or your I hate gods and, and what have you. So this came out in 94. I believe by that point, Crowbar had released the self-titled record. I think that might have came out around the same period. So, like, listen to those two records. Um, you know, uh, I Hate God had released uh, Take Is Needed for Pain by this point. I mean, listen to those these three records together, and it's like three completely opposite things. Um, but you can find elements of each in each of them. But maybe that's Maybe the way that this band sound has more to do with the fact that they were isolated from New Orleans. 
They were so isolated in a small town that nothing of what they were playing with and the bands they were playing with were really influencing them the same way that maybe some of the sludge bands did. Because arguably you could find more in common between maybe an I Hate God record, a Crowbar record, than maybe you could either of those in this album. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's kind of like the same thing we have with like grunge music. Right, where yes. They are under this umbrella, yet none of them sound anything alike. Right. Yet you can find elements that they share. I mean, shit, all of these bands have shared members at one point or another. Sammy yes, being that's, that's kind true. of like the revolving kind of member in, the, in each of those bands in, in more ways than others. But um, the next couple songs, you got Dope Fiend, you got Tubabo Kumi, uh, which is Cajun French for Land of the White Cannibals. Uh, the only song on this album to have a music video. Ah, uh, the Gator story. The Gator story. Uh, you know, obviously Wild the video band, too. What? Yeah, it's just the swamp. You're basically just like in the country, it seems like. And there's some gators in the video. Yep. Um, from what I understand, just based off of Sammy's words himself, uh, you know, they were basically riling up this gator that they had caught or the video, you got to have a pissed off gator. You can't have a gator just sitting there lazily. You got to get to act a little bit. You got to show up for God. the video. He was um, fluffing the gator. He was oh, a gator no, fluffer. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> he was a gator fluffer. He, he, was, gator touching, fl- he, was, he touching, was touching on that. Gator. He was Neil Diamonding the gator. <laughs> one one of us could be so blessed to be uh, in the gator fluffing profession. Um, That's a Johnny but, Knoxville bit. That is Jackass uh, you, 5, the gator fluffer. The gator fluffer. <laughs> so they're agitating the gator to make it angry for the video. And the guy who caught the gator picks it up on his shoulder. And he's like, oh, this thing's fine. It's not going to hurt me. And the thing just fucking bites him in the face. Like literally the gator just bites this man in the face. Like, All st- while the band is looking at him going like, <laughs> you probably shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. Wild. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Oh, you fuck, fuck with a vicious animal. It's going to bite you. Huh? Great video. Great song. Um, there's also uh, a thing about this record, too, that I, I rather enjoy. I love a good sample, as we know from previous episodes. Yep. The next song, God Machine, features a sample of the Jerry Springer show. I fucking uh, knew it was Springer before I even had to look <laughs> it up. I fucking knew it. And I loved it for that fact. I was like, I grew up watching Jerry Springer when I would skip school, so I know what this is. Yeah, Dill was sick. He had the he had the the. Mums. I was watching Steve Wilkos keep people from beating Jerry's old ass. <laughs> He's a Chicago guy, right? Yeah, I think I think both of those shows were based no, in because Chicago. Springer was he was like uh, he was a politician. Cincinnati. He was a Cincinnati. Was a Cincinnati mayor, okay. but I think both of those shows were eventually based in Chicago. Amazing. Yeah, pretty great stuff. A lot of music tie-ins with Jerry Springer as well. Yeah, we could go on and on. Yep, Typo, The Locust. Yeah, we also have uh, <laughs> we also have the the last track also features some samples from some movies, mm-hmm. Clockwork Orange, Blue Velvet. So I mean, that's yeah, probably I, I, my favorite track on the album is Cassie's really? Cockroaches. Yep, that's my favorite track on the album. There's some there's some good ones on here. The end of the album, also. Uh, the riff and the vocals to me very mud vein, very slipknot. Yep. yep. The opening of the track is kind of the same way. It's that kind of like hammer on pull off riff that's at the beginning of that. Uh yeah, absolutely. Very the what's the oh it, it it's kind of like a deft tone style riff. Like that's their thing. The just so, like honed in single notes. Uh like that's that's a big thing. My brain is not working musically at this point. A staccato. That's the word I'm looking for. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. Uh, very staccato riffing. Um, I don't want to skip through these other tracks, but they're these are all. It's like the back half of this record I preferred almost more than the front half of it. Okay. Even um, Mortician's Flame is a really cool track. Um, the co- or what color is Death is really cool. The Bones of Baby Dolls. That's the acoustic track. Anytime yep. I hear it, I hear the opening guitar arpeggiated acoustic part. And it makes me think of Don't Cry by Guns N' Roses. Oh, interesting. Same okay. chord progression. Obviously, it's vastly different song. But I hear that. I'm like, sounds like Don't Cry. But that's probably just that simple CGF chord progression. I don't know. I may I may even go as far as to say that I, I like. 
I don't know if I like one particular side of the record mm-hmm. more than the other. I think I like parts, different parts a little bit. Like I, I like the first few songs from the beginning. Right. You know, kind of like a little in the middle, a little at the end. So it's hard for me to pick like one or the other, but but I, I definitely see what you're saying. Um, yeah. And that really just kind of amounts to like an over an, an hour plus runtime here. What I what I really want to say about the record too is that it's I felt like the band's writing on this album definitely dictated what the next record sounded like. And this is one of those bands that probably, I mean, we'll get into the story, but they could have very well just have written this record. And that would have been it because the next record almost sounds completely different. True. In scope. I would agree. Um, it's a, this is a very enjoyable record. It's long, but it's enjoyable. I think when I listen to it the next go around, I'll probably split it in two and be like, here's the first 35, here's the second 35, and treat it as like two records. That may be the better way for me to digest it. That's fair. It it Uh, riffs fucking hard. Um, The whole record riffs like like a motherfucker. Um, seeing Seeing the influence of this record on other forms of music and maybe not hearing those artists say, oh yeah, we definitely checked out Acid Bath uh, for whatever reason it is wild. And that may be due to the fact that Rotten Records wasn't able to distribute it or chose not to distribute it properly. Uh, but that's not to say that this band didn't sell a weirdly decent amount of records. Uh, from what I understand, they sold 37,000 copies in, in the United States, which, you know, for a band that really didn't have the backing, mm-hmm. they you know, independent label. It's much smaller than the, yeah. the labels that we discussed, Century Media and Roadrunner. You know, you don't really have like a mainstream connection and yet you sell uh, this many copies. Now, there may be an argument. Maybe is it the record itself? Is it the album artwork? I don't know. I think this album... It's a whole package. I, you, you're totally right. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things going for it. Maybe you get drawn in with the album artwork. Obviously, that's just the marketing of it like oh shit look at that that's fucking bleak yeah but you you turn it on and you like it matches you know the the feeling the yeah. look of it for it's, sure it's it's part of the whole package i'm sure we've all bought records or cds or whichever based off the cover hell we do it with horror movies all the time like yeah. look how stupid this looks i'm gonna watch it you know or anything like that. I still do it. You know, every so often I will go to a record store and buy something based off what it looks like, having no knowledge of what it sounds like. Just like, I've never heard it. Let's give it a shot. And I've picked up some really cool stuff that way. And if it's got the right image on the, the, you know, the seller, you know, the, the eight by 10, basically, um, you're going to pick it up. If it's a good looking eight by 10, you're going to pick it up and you go, all right, Something about this image. Some kid may not have any idea that that is a John Wayne Gacy portrait. Have no clue. Most adults probably didn't. True. Yeah, absolutely. And they're going to pick it up and go, I don't know what this is, but it, it looks, it looks scary. Uh, I mean, it's not a pleasant image. You know, most, I would say a lot of people, if not most people have a weird feeling towards clowns anyway. Um, They're going to pick that up and go, huh. This looks like something. Hail the disco beat, because there are two songs on this album. Ah, uh, I totally forgot about that. The Dr. Seuss song and uh, Mortician's Flame. Both of those songs have the disco beat. So I would like to give my applause to the drummer for finding a way to put disco beats in sludge metal. I totally forgot to put that in my notes, but you're absolutely right. That's another thing that new metal did, too. (laughs) <laughs> true so, i mean absolutely like that that kind of disco beat with the hi-hat and everything like it's it's right there much like the goat whore album uh this album just ends just yeah. a very abrupt end they're plugging along at the end of this uh last song and then it's just like boop. just hammer hitting a nail just bap yeah. just done the classic universal see ya um <laughs> yeah it is abrupt for sure uh like we said received fairly well sold a lot of copies uh they also toured off of this record as well 90, what a weird tour that, that big one yeah so in 94 
the acid bath toured with Cannibal Corpse, Grave, and Samael. That's it. Um, Cannibal Corpse had just released The Bleeding. Uh, we've kind of talked about this in previous episodes. Mm-hmm. Death Metal essentially at its peak in a lot of ways. Uh, maybe you could go a couple years later when you know you have like all of the major label yeah. uh, releases. But at the time, it was definitely like this was a very popular form of aggressive music. And so you have all of these bands like Grave and Cannibal who sound one way and then you have Acid Bath on your lineup. I think people are, you know, just based off of what Sammy has said in in some of the videos that he's done for the the YouTube channel. Maybe people didn't necessarily hate it, but they were certainly confused. Yeah. You know, seeing a band like coming to see a band like Cannibal and then you open with a band like Acid Bath is, is certainly going to be interesting. If I remember correctly, the way Cannibal has kind of picked their openers is they were bands that they liked. So someone in that camp absolutely liked Acid Bath. Absolutely did. And maybe it was a tie back from when they were in Golgotha, which was a little bit more kind of death metal oriented uh, or any of their older days that way. Um, But like seeing this package on tour had to be something because even Samael is um, a little bit more almost industrial black metal by this point. Um, it, it's a weird bill. It's an interesting bill. Uh, Grave is probably more in vain of some of the sludge stuff from Acid Bath than even Cannibal is because like Grave is, Grave's like death and roll shit and it's awesome. Um, the, the Soulless album is one to really fucking like jam out to. Uh, but I mean, could you imagine? Like we know... We know that our metalhead brethren are um, selective about things. And in 1994, they're far more selective. So could you imagine like wheeling into that and going, man, I just see denim vest. I see all the patches. I see the hair down to people's ass, like high top, you know, Reebok, Nikes, and just standing there mouths agape as like acid bath kicks in with this like, dynamic vocal prowess it's like when corn opened for fucking biohazard like it's <laughs> it's fucking wild you know cannibal took cynic out on tour and like was middle fingers the whole fucking night so this had to be akin to that but like what a good way to get your fucking feet wet with touring to go out with like cannibal corpse at arguably their peak and uh in the death metal scene when it's at its peak yeah the fans were probably like Wait a second. This is slow. Oh, oh. You're telling me that <laughs> no. <laughs> they make slow music. Uh, speaking of slow things and the you know kind of challenging uh, listeners' perceptions of records and you know their listening habits. Uh, you know, as D- Dylan mentioned before, um, pagan terrorism tactics from '96 uh, kind of sounds very different. Yeah. To this record, uh, uh, they it, maybe it's a little more. It's got like I've heard maybe it's got more of like a melodic. It definitely does. It's it certainly has a different kind of influence, maybe hard rock a little bit as well. I don't know. It's it's different. It's when I went back record. and listened to that record uh, a couple years ago, um, I actually enjoyed that one in a, as a whole a little bit more. That one to me sounds more like a stoner rock record, I guess. Uh, Sludge has a little bit more of an aggro vibe to it when I hear that, and that's how I kind of differentiate between what's Sludge and what's Stoner. Um, Stoner's got more of that kind of bluesy, old-school hard rock. Maybe they listen to um, the more melodic sensibilities of Sabbath, whereas like Sludge is like, I want the heaviest shit known to man. What's the, what's the Jimmy Bauer line about going to the desert? Oh, Wheels well, of Confusion. I mean, yeah, Wheels of Confusion. Like, uh, you also have like the Melvins in there. Yep. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, my war also. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think at this point you kind of see the band start to unravel a little bit. Um, you're growing up, you're into different things. Maybe you're going to have other ideas that other people in the band don't necessarily jive with. I think Dax wanted to maybe write more acoustic songs mm-hmm. or have like go a different direction. And these guys are like, you know, I mean, Sammy's still just a hundred percent full-on metal dude so you know i'm sure things creatively start to clash and you know you 
maybe just kind of yeah. get tired of trying to bring forth songs that nobody really wants to hear or they don't they don't really click with. Yeah. You know, I I was 13 or 14 years old and I went and stayed with a buddy at his dad's place one summer and we were talking about different types of music we were into and his his dad was like you know, at a certain point like you might slow down and want to listen to something that's maybe a little bit more melodic. And I remember distinctly saying, yeah, but right now I'm going to listen to the most aggressive shit I possibly can because I have that. I'm 33 fucking years old. I'm still doing it. It's like, it's, I definitely see like Sammy being one of those people like, yeah, I'm going to listen to this other stuff. But like, I, I still got to have like blast beats in my ear at like four o'clock in the morning, like that kind of thing. Like I want to wake up with my coffee and there's blast beats playing or anything like that. And not everybody in the world is like that. And when it comes to bands, not everybody's going to have that same mindset. You're going to have guys that want to maybe get a little bit more melodic, get a little bit more experimental. Um, Maybe they don't want to do it at all anymore. Um, You're going to have that, especially when you're really young and you're going to have that separation and you're going to have those friendships that it, if you want them to stand the test of time, they will. And sometimes they don't, um, you know, with this band, there was, a maybe that's why the second album sounded the way it did. Maybe there was already that like dissension between it. And there was a lot more compromise on that record than originally intended by one portion of the group. Maybe camps had started up. I know you hear that a lot about different bands. Like black Sabbath was the big one. It was like Tony and geezer. And then it was Dio and, uh, Vinny. At one point, that's the one that always reigns true for me. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if the band would even still be around by this point, even before the tragedy happened. Right, and so essentially, what really kind of did this band in? You know, Audie, who by all accounts was kind of a the glue, the glue that held everything together. Yep. You know, this band likely would have broken up at some point, perhaps because of the creative conflicts. But unfortunately, Audie, the, their bass player, was tragically killed in a in a car accident, mm-hmm. and you know that that's hard. I'm sure these guys had known each other a long time. You know, you kind of you're you're growing up together. You're young. You're playing music together, and then all of a sudden, you know, your your best friend, your bass player, is is murdered essentially, like in in a like a drunk driving accident. Yeah. Um, so they attempt to play shows following this tragedy, and you know, I don't think I think everybody could see the writing on the wall. It just didn't feel the same. The their heart wasn't in it anymore. Um, it just feels weird. It feels weird knowing that someone's gone. So yeah. I think I read that their last show was actually at a uh, club called Texas Billiard, uh, Billiards, which was owned by Don Bagdarrell in Arlington, Texas. Um, or with the, that's the with the last full lineup, and then they continued to try to play like maybe into early 97 and it just it just didn't work so so their last show was at like an amphitheater or something like that mm-hmm. that was poorly promoted uh, oh geez audie's brother was going to be playing bass uh at this point and it was poorly promoted so like there wasn't anybody there and the band didn't get paid uh so, so that was like going out on a bummer right I hope I'm getting the stories right because someone asked Sammy about that and he goes, no, we got the money. Um, basically, Kirk Winstein like was at the show and like held this dude up and like all Sammy said was like, we got the money. We got it. So who knows? That's like the gang green story, right? Uh, somebody didn't pay gang green. So like they drove to the promoter's house, broke into his house, stole a bunch of shit and beat the dude up. Oh my God. I Motherfuckers never gotta get paid. Before. You got to get paid. Um, so the band breaks up. People go on and do their own things. Uh, you know, Dax and Mike Sanchez went on to form Agents of Oblivion for cool a record. little while. Uh, later on, Riggs would do Dead Boy and The Elephant Men. He's kind of since been doing music under his own name. Obviously, Sammy himself was a member of Crowbar briefly. Goat Whore, as we mentioned in the last episode. And uh, a few other bands, Ritual Killer, Vol. Uh, with Audie, Audie's brother. Um, so, yeah, you know, band kind of 
fades into kind of metal lore and history. And, you know, for a long time, you really couldn't stream or listen to a lot of this stuff, as we mentioned. So more recently, it's been, you know, obvious the record's up now. You can listen to it on streaming. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see some sort of like physical copies of this record, like a like a package done if they if, you know, the people at Rotten Records uh, maybe play nice or something. But I'm surprised that a larger label hasn't picked it up. Right. You know, I know Phil and Salmo had house core that would pick up a couple like classic records. I know they repressed like the whole I hate God catalog at a, at a certain point when it was out of press. I'm surprised they haven't picked it up or I'm surprised like relapse hasn't picked it up. Uh, hell, who knows? It, there may have been a question of I'm surprised Metal Blade hasn't picked it up because it's a tie in with an artist that's been on their roster for almost 20 years. But maybe the asking price is so high. The way Sammy has made it out is it's excruciatingly high. That's crazy. Um, there's also been, you know, rumors of mm -hmm. reunions over the years. I think, um, you know, at one point, a member of the band was going to... There were there were some questions of perhaps playing some shows again. Uh, Dax, the, the vocalist, has been kind of adamant yeah. that he's not interested in doing that. So... There was rumors of like maybe Corey, Corey Taylor of all people uh, filling in and that's been kind of quickly stomped out. Uh, they perhaps were maybe interested in doing some tribute shows. So uh, nothing really known at this time if that's going to be a thing. But you know, there's always those those always those <laughs> things kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, there's always those rumors kind of flying around with a band like this. You just you know, there's always going to be what could have been. What would it what would it be like now? Uh, you know, and that'll probably likely be the story, you know, going forward. What what could have been? What could have possibly been the trajectory of a band like this? The U.S. has these great festivals that go on for like underground music, uh, a la like Maryland Death Fest. Um, you know, it would have been great to see a band like this on that stage, even if it was a one time thing. And maybe they played this record in whole uh, or selections from this record. Um, that would have been great. I. I don't think anybody's necessarily asking for an act like this to tour ever again. They just want to see that one show that people can like drive to or anything like that. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of bands do a lot of reunions and just do that exclusively. And it works out. Everyone gets to like hear those songs for the first time. Some, some people that got into this record weren't even born in 94. You know, uh, some younger people are into this record, I'm sure. And being able to see those songs live with even, you know, you know, eighty percent of the lineup, uh, just doing it and getting a f close friend of the band or maybe you know Audie's brother to come back and play bass, anything like that to do it just one time, you know. But I'm not in that band, so I can't make that decision. I personally can't wait for the Acid Bath reunion tour with Zach Wild on uh <laughs> on bass charlie from he's anthrax got, on uh <laughs> he's got the bullseye bass damn right <laughs> i always thought this band needed some more pinch harmonics needs, honestly yep. well there was a uh, one song damn i closed my notes already uh <laughs> but there was one song that i specifically took note of the pinch harmonics oh well there you I, go there's yep there's um it's earlier on the album um because it, it's yep i know the one uh, Dope Fiend. Dope Fiend has pinch harmonics all over it. So then all I'm over. wrong. So there's that song, but there's a song on the earlier half of the record that's got natural harmonics, a la like Machine Head or early uh, Neurosis, where they're just like letting the notes ring out and that has that dissonance to it. So again, more weird shit on this kind of oddball, yeah. fantastic album. It's a great, it's a great listen. There's a lot of history. Uh, you know, we've only kind of scratched the surface. So Listen to the record. Check out some of the videos that you can find at the Acid Bath Archive. They were very helpful for us in kind of doing some research in this uh, album. But uh, I'd love to hear what your thoughts were on this record. Uh, maybe some uh, of the history that you found it interesting. You can always comment that below. All right, we've reached the point of the episode where we like to share some things that we've been listening to, some recommendations. Uh, I only got one for you this week. This is a Chicago hardcore punk band. Uh, with their debut record, Harsh Reality, which is out now through 3-1-G. Of course, uh, Justin Pearson's label of The Locust, uh, Retox, a bunch of other fucking bands, Dead Cross. Um, this is a band called Stress Positions. They were formed in 2020. 
uh, kind of during the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, they've been playing some shows around here lately, and uh, they just released their debut record. So I've been listening to it a lot. It's fast as fuck. Uh, they got some videos, I believe, out for it now. But um, I want to say this band was formed through the ashes of a now defunct Chicago hardcore band known as Chew, which I also really liked. Basically, the uh, three members of that band with a new singer formed Stress Position. So check it out. Harsh Reality, it's out now through through 1G. I really like it. My recommendation is uh, an old album that's uh, a compilation of old albums that's seen a new re-release, and that's uh, the Bucket Full of Teeth discography, uh, albums one through four, and the vinyl copy already sold out, uh, but it's on Spotify now, so freaking uh, listen to your heart's content. It's, four uh, albums, 45 minutes? Yeah, yeah, which is... It's kind of long for like power violence, emo violence kind of shit, but uh, it's Will Killingsworth of Ampere, Orchid, Vaccine, 10 million other bands, uh, the vocalist of Orchid. Uh, I think it's pre Ampere. Uh, but yeah, Vinyl just came back out. You can't buy it. Don't try, <laughs> but you can stream on Spotify. I went a little old school too. Uh, I went back almost 20 years uh, with it being kind of the holiday season and it being known for snow and kind of bitter weather. I went back and listened to my favorite immortal record, which is at the heart of winter Um, classic album. I I always tie this band in with this album. Um, This is right when they started to get a little bit more thrashy, maybe Um, great album. Abath is the, is the fucking man. Uh, I love that dude's vocals. I love his guitar playing style. Uh, if you liked my uh, suggestion of the Lamp of Murmur album uh, in our end of the year episode, you're going to like this album. Perfect. Well, thanks for the Rex guys. Uh, we'll be back next week talking about another, you know, uh, trilogy record in the Sammy Duay's catalog that we really, really like. You can always follow us for any updates on the show at Distortion 891. Uh, for our live show that's still going on through 2024 airs every Monday through 6 p 6 p.m. 8 central. Um, yeah, thanks again. We'll see you next week talking about riffs. Oh yeah.